Well, like everyone else, thank you very much indeed for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I visited two years ago and really enjoyed visiting Buenos Aires, so it was a great pleasure to be invited again. I, I said I was going to talk about refactoring for functional programs, and I will do that, but I, I was thinking, how should I try and frame this? Um, and what I came up with was thinking a bit about um, what we've done over the last 10, 12 years in terms of building tools and what sort of lessons there are in general for people who build tools. So trying to move it. I will talk about I'll, the talks, really a number of anecdotes about what we've done and showing you some code and some, some examples and so on. But also trying to draw a few lessons about what building tools is like, particularly in this space where we're trying to process programming languages. So that's the shape of things. I, as Phil, this is a result of collaborations with a, a, a substantial number of people. You know, particularly, I'd, I'd shout out to He King Lee, who worked with me for a number of years on um, refactoring both for Haskell and for um, Erlang. A number of other colleagues, some of whom are working with me now at Kent and at um, ELTE in Budapest, and other uh, and Jane Street, who are working with us on a on a current project. So lots of people have helped to get us where we've got to. Um, and I think some of the things I'll talk about in the lessons I, I'll, I'll try and draw out, some are about some science, some basic science, as Phil was talking. Some are about engineering. A lot are to do with human factors. If you're building tools, then, then there are people in the loop, and that makes there are things to say about that. And um, questions about usability and trust, um, and about the way that automation works in these systems, or doesn't. Um, and then finally, reflecting a bit about what languages are like, you know, where languages are at. It's interesting in the previous talk, hearing about how you know, computing history, we feel computing moves incredibly quickly. You know, Google came onto the scene and, and completely changed the world. But some of the ways we program haven't, haven't changed dramatically. Um, you know, Lisp was invented in 1960, Haskell is getting old. Um, so wh what can we learn about the languages we've been trying to refactor? But first of all, what do I mean by refactoring? People use that word in all sorts of different contexts. It might mean something like, oh dear, okay, you can't see the color on this. Um, there's a bit of pink and a bit of green. One line has been changed. That could be a refactoring. Or you could take a vast system. You're not meant to be able to read the, the names on that. But you could take a vast system and try and do something substantial, different um, in that system. In both cases, what you're trying to do, and the crucial thing about refactoring is that you're taking a, a, a system, you're trying to modify how it works, but you're trying to keep invariant what, how it actually behaves, what it does. So what it does is constant, how it does it can change. Um, and refactoring can be very crude. You, know, you, could be, you could be taking medieval methods, if you like, of trepanning with a, a rather stoic-looking person on the right having their, their skull removed. Or you could be doing something much more surgical. You could have state-of-the-art. And people use, use the terminology of refactoring to, to, re, to refer to both sorts of things. I think for me, um, and I think I've said this already, they, these changes can be large or, large or small. They can be local or global. But we do, the crucial thing is we're trying to make sure we're not changing what the program does. We're modifying how it does it in order perhaps to extend it or to make it more efficient or to make it more readable or to allow it to integrate with something else. We have, a lot, we have reasons for doing it, but we don't want to change what it actually does. Um, so particularly if you look at functional languages, often what people do when they talk about refactoring, or mean when they talk about refactoring, is just working at the level of expressions. Um, and there are tools to do this. There's a very nice tool, HLint, um, for Haskell, which Neil Mitchell has produced, and also a tool for, um, for Erlang that Costas Sagonas and his colleagues have produced, which allows you to take a single expression like um, fold R1 applied to the AND operator and say, why don't you use the AND function? Um, and that's helpful. It allows you to enforce um, style and so on. But it's not the sort of thing I'm very interested in. We can do that. I can do that by hand. I'm not, I, there's not much of a challenge there. Um, it's not difficult to do. Um, so I think what we're interested in, and particularly when we're thinking about building tools, is things which go beyond the local. Um, 
So that might be renaming a function, and I'll come back to this, this question of renaming um, through the talk. Renaming a function, renaming a module, renaming a type, renaming a structure. Because we know how important naming is, right? You know, if, you take a, they, if you take a program and replace all the names in the program with, a non, with random strings, you'll find it very difficult indeed to understand what the program does. We interpret, we give meaningful names to things in programs because those things help us to understand it. So naming is not a trivial, it's not just a matter of choosing a random string. It's important that the name reflects what the program does. And you see things, people might change the, the style of naming. You might want to take a whole project and move from one naming style to another. You're putting together two projects which have been developed by different teams. You want to have a uniform way of naming things across those two. We also do things like generalizing. And this is, again, something we do often in a, in a functional language, I think, much more, much more readily than perhaps we do in other, in other languages, or extracting a definition. Um, so an example, and I'll show you examples in OCaml, Erlang, Haskell, just so you get a, everything's functional, but all different flavors of functional. So here's a bit of Erlang, and perhaps we've, we've, we've hit on the fact, oh, this doesn't show up. We've hit on the fact that we want to turn these three lines inside the function into um, a, separate, a separate function. So if I go back here, it's these three lines which might have been pink, but they're not. Um, and we say, let's turn those into a function. And what we've done here is pull those lines out. We've replaced the, where they were by a function call. And we've, we've seen, this is the sort of thing that a tool can help with. We've seen that some, there are some identifiers like message and n, which are free names in there. So we better make them parameters of the, the function. So that's a, nice, that's a nice example of the sorts of things that we look at. Um, but you know, what, larger scale, we might look at something like changing a type representation. We might move from a concrete data type to an abstract data type. That's something we've done um, with our Haskell tool. We might want to change a library for a, a, an API for a library. Um, people do this. I don't know why. The Erlang. <clears throat> the Erlang standard library for regular expressions a few releases ago changed from one interface to a completely different one, including indexing positions in regular expressions starting at one rather than zero, just for the hell of it. Um, and we might want to look at the way modules are, are, are interrelated. So we're looking at the structure of, of a program, trying to pull something out, trying to make the structure simpler, and so on. Okay, so that's the sort of ball, that's the area we're looking at. Um, and so what we've done is we've, we've tried to build, build tools. And one of the things that you, you think about when you first start to build a tool to do refactoring, is you think, okay, what we're doing in refactoring is we're doing program transformation. Um, and yes, indeed we are, but and, and we, can, we can implement that, there are ways we can do that, but we're not just doing that. Um, what we're doing as well is thinking about the preconditions which make that transformation preserve meaning. And often, that's the more complicated part of the process. For example, in renaming, we're potentially changing at one point in the program representation a name from foo to bar, but in order for that not to change the meaning of the program, we've got to do an analysis of, quite a complex analysis potentially, of how, that, how the naming works in that language in order to make sure we don't wreck our program. So crucially, we're doing, implementing both those things. Um, and of course, there's a question, how, do we, how should we refactor? And the answer is that most people do, do stuff by hand, using an editor. Um, and I'll come back to, to whether, whether that's a good thing, what the pluses and minuses are for that. Um, but it, is, it makes some things difficult to do in the large. Um, it makes things error prone, and it's potentially quite tedious. And I will come, come to some examples of that. So if we go for support doing things in a tool, we can hopefully handle transformation and, and the analysis. 
So again, going back to the analysis, the, 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 hand, anal the, the hand transformation we do in an editor with a substitution. You know, we substitute foo for bar in various places. But the editor isn't going to help us with, with knowing, off the, um, unless we've, we've done quite a lot of work to modify it, the editor isn't going to help us know whether that is going to preserve program's meaning. So hopefully, if we do things, um, if we do things in a way that are um, automated, we can scale. Of course, we'd, we'd say that. Computers can, as Phil was saying earlier on, com computers can do a lot of things very quickly. Um, and hopefully, we can also integrate with other things. Because one of the things that you realize when you start doing this is that programs, systems, don't have a clear boundary. You know, what does the code for your system consist of? Is it, the, is it the code for the, the program itself? Oh no, perhaps I better remember the build script. What about the tests? So if you're starting to do wholesale renamings, you then have to think about how that will impact on your, your whole ecosystem. So hopefully we can, we can help to do that as well. So there are potentially lots of advantages in doing this. And the way that we refactor, there's a program at the top. Typically what we do is we parse a program, we analyze it, so we get, as Phil was saying earlier on, we, programs are represented internally um, in systems as syntax trees. Typically not just syntax trees, but probably annotated sy syntax trees or augmented syntax trees, which have extra information about static syntax, types, and so on and so forth. So not just representing the syntax, but lots of complex information on top. So we parse, we analyze, um, we transform, getting another, and then we um, produce code back out. And this is one of the things that makes this different from what a typical compiler might do, um, is that we're producing source code at the end. And I'll come back to this and the challenges that that brings. Yes, because typically a compiler will parse and analyze. It will typically then transform into a lower level representation or machine code or whatever. But what we're wanting to do here is get back a program which is recognizable to its, um, its owner. Um, and we do this by traversing through trees. We might traverse upwards through the syntax tree, or we might traverse downwards up to a certain, down, down to a certain point. Um, so we, use, we typically use this sort of, of um, traversal, this sort of strategy for um, applying the transformation, and also for collecting information. Um, so that gives you a whirlwind tour of what, what refactoring tools, um, what we're trying to do. Let me just give you a, a, a very short introduction to the things that we've, we've built. Um, for Haskell, um, Erlang, and OCaml, and they each bring their own challenges. Um, I mean, Haskell has a, a complex type system, and Haskell is it's layout sensitive. Layout, the layout of the program determines its semantics. Um, whereas with Erlang, we, we're, we're looking particularly, one of the challenges there is looking at concurrency, how we do refactor programs around concurrency. It's also got a macro system, which of course is a nightmare for, um, and with OCaml, we have a very, very rich language for building modules. We have modules, we have functors that transform modules into modules, and so on. Um, so there are, there are, and one of the, perhaps one of the um, points I'll make a bit later on, um, but just to prefigure it now, these are all functional languages. I think we would all agree that. But they're, they're quite different. There are really quite different things going on in there. You know, just lay, you've got lazy evaluation. We, Haskell is entirely pure. Modulo, um, one or two things. Whereas Erlang has some side effects. It's strict. Um, OCaml has some side effects. Again, it's strict. Erlang's weakly typed. OCaml is strongly typed, as is Haskell. So there's a lot of variation within that, that family um, of languages. And on top of those, we built three tools. Um, we built a tool called Hair which we built, um, started building around 2002. And at that time, it wouldn't have made any sense to use the internals of GHC. GHC was, it was, a, it was a jungle into which some people strayed and very few people emerged. Um, it was a very difficult, but we used a different front end for that. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a bit about our approach to engineering later on. 
Um, but that was designed to work with Haskell 98. Um, that was the, the prevailing standard at the time. Um, we've a tool, probably the most fully developed tool we've built is a tool called Wrangler. It was called Wrangler because wrangling is sort of messing around with things, and it's almost an anagram of Erlang. I, th I thought people would guess that. If you cross out the W, it's an anagram of Erlang. Well, it's with an extra. Oh, yeah. Fine. Uh, uh, so we could have called it Angular. Thank you. Wow. Okay. Good. <laughs> um, and there we've we've been able to tackle a number of a, a number of things like concurrency. We've we've looked at how we might help users to build more complex refactorings by giving them a, a domain-specific language for putting together refactorings, simple refactorings into more complex assemblies. Um, and with OCaml, this is the work that we're doing at the moment, um, we've particularly focused on, on building a, a reliable tool for renaming. Uh, that came out of working with Jane Street, who are a, a large financial um, house based in London and New York, and they have, they're the prime supporters of the OCaml ecosystem. They use OCaml throughout their, their systems. And one of the problems that they, they come up against is because they, they, um, they're highly regulated, they do code review for accepting changes. Um, and the changes they find really difficult to review are refactoring changes, renamings. So if we can provide them with a tool that will give them assurance that the tool is doing what it should be doing, I'll come back to that later, um, they will be happy, they will see that it will allow them to satisfy their regulatory obligations. Um, what have I said in here? One thing that you can see is that we're using different bits of existing infrastructure, and I will say this later, but let me say it now as well. You know, reusing what's there was, was a philosophy that we had right from the start. Why write another compiler if there is one there that we can use? Um, so. Just check the time. Okay, right. I think I've talked through that. And this, this gives you a block diagram of, of Wrangler. It's got some basic stuff. We've built on top of it a number of specialized tools like a clone detection tool, module structure improvement, and then we've got an API for defining new refactorings from scratch, and a DSL for assembling refactorings into composites. So that's, the, that's what Wrangler looks like. Um, and there you can see what we've done is embed it there in, in Emacs. Um, so you've got those wonderful Emacs, control C, control W, R, M for renaming module name. What could be simpler? But just, this re replies to, to Wrangler, but it applies to the others as well. In order to, to build the tool, we have to do quite a lot of analysis. It's not simply parsing. We have to think about which variables are bound to which declarations, as it were. If you see a variable x, which x is that talking about? We have to think about types. I um, have to think about modules. In, in Erlang, we have to think about side effects. If we're going to um, abstract over an expression or generalizing a function, we'd better think about whether the expression we're trying to abstract over has a side effect. So we need to think about that sort of analysis. But there's other stuff in Erlang as well. Erlang has primitive data called atoms that are just used, they just represent what they stand for. Um, our prime minister, oh no, she's no longer our prime minister, our acting prime minister, Theresa May, had a motto that um, in, in 2016, after the vote, vote for Brexit, was Brexit means Brexit, and it's a great, it's a great way of explaining what atoms are, because it doesn't tell you anything. Brexit just means Brexit, but you know, so what? Um, <laughs> So atoms are there, but atoms can, in some situations, can stand for a function or a module. So we have to try and understand when we see an atom, does it mean that function, does it mean that module, or does it mean something entirely different? Erlang um, is a concurrent language. You get multiple processes in Erlang. So if we're thinking about doing refactorings, for example, to name a, um, a particular process rather than referring to it by its identifier, uh, by a, a, a dynamic ID, we need to understand the process structure. We need to deal with macros, oh no. And th there are conventions and frameworks that we need to think about, like the, the way that the test framework names functions. 
So there's a lot of stuff goes into the tool in order to be sure that what the transformations it does serve the purpose they should. Now, oh, you can hardly see them, but never mind. We teach our, our beginning students about, they do some, some very simple stuff about product design. And we say, to, we get them to do an exercise um, where we say, you know, design this, they, typically it's an app. And then they have to think about three aspects of that app. Um, one of them is, is it feasible? Can you actually build this app or this system? Um, so we, they need to think about that, because if you can't build it, there's no point in, you know, no point in going any further. The next thing you have to think about is whether it's um, viable. Can you actually make money out of it? You know, is it going to be worth, is it worth building? You might be able to produce it, but it could be so expensive to produce that nobody in their right mind is going to think about buying it. So it needs to be, it needs to be realized, you, know, you need to be able to build it, you need to be able to build it at a cost which is reasonable. And you also then need people to want to use it. It needs to be desirable or usable. So I thought we teach our students this. Why don't I apply it to um, these tools that we built ourselves? So what I'm going to do for the rest of the session is talk a bit about how we've had to think about questions of feasibility. Can we do it? Viability. Well, actually, no. I, in viability, we're not trying to sell these things. We're in the research business. We're not trying to sell them, but there's something else that we would like to get. Um, we'd like them to be sustainable. And I will think about... You know, we put this effort in, how can we be sure that they will still be usable in 10 years' time? So thinking about that, and also thinking about how can we make, get, make sure that people will come along and use, um, use these things. How much longer have I got? 30 minutes. 30 minutes, okay. I'll have to speed up, but never mind. Let's talk about feasibility. Um, let's talk a bit about renaming. You think, well, why is he going to talk about renaming? What is there to say? Um, well, we need to think sometimes about um, how a name, how, what a name means. And it's not always just down to the static semantics. And I want to show you, dig down a bit into an example from, from OCaml. We can't just, reg regular expressions are not good enough for making sure, for getting us from a use of a name to where it's bound. So we will use parts of the compiler. Um, oh, let me just, I'm just going to skip over that. But here's an example of, this is an Erlang, a perfectly acceptable Erlang program, which it's, the module is called foo. There's a function called foo, um, a one, a zero argument function called foo, and a, a one argument function called foo. Um, and there I'm calling foo by, uh, I'm spawning a new process in the module foo with uh, function foo with a single argument foo. Um, suppose I want to rename this function. Which of the foos do I have to change? Well, the answer is I have to change that one, that one, and that one. So we need to do that analysis there. Oh, and let me skip over this. So I think, yeah, I was going to try and bring in some more examples there, but perhaps um, I'm, just because of the peculiarities of languages, you know, the gap between Haskell and OCaml and Erlang, I'm very skeptical that we can ever build language independent refactoring tools. I mean, sorry, just to go back to this Erlang example. This is valid. Here where we have a receive clause which introduces the variable x in both the patterns that it um, can handle, I'm then allowed to use that value x outside the received clause. That's valid, whoops. Um, it's not valid there because x is only declared in one of, the, one of the clauses. So you've got multiple binding occurrences of a variable. That's just a bit of a lang horror for you. But you can see other things in different, in different languages. So I think the idea of, of going for language independent myself, I think is just, I, I'm very deeply skeptical. If you want to build tools that will actually reflect 
the complexity of each individual language. If somebody says they've got a, re a refactoring tool that, that does that, if you open, say for OCaml and Erlang, I bet if you open the lid, there's a refactoring tool for OCaml and a refactoring tool for Erlang inside. I suspect the commonality is quite small. But that's just, that's entirely opinionated. I'm happy to, disargue, uh, to argue with you about it, if you wish, or discuss it in a full and frank way. One thing that we had to deal with when looking at OCaml, um, let me just show you a tiny bit of OCaml. This says we've got a module type stringable. So it's a module type. This is a, a type um, which can be applied to a structure. It contains a type and a function to turn that type into it, something of that type into a string. Whoa, what have we got here? We've got here a functor which takes two stringable things. X is stringable and Y is stringable. And it returns um, another thing which has a... Um, a two-string function and a type. Um, and what the two-string function does, it, it two-strings the X bit, it two-strings the Y bit, and joins them together. Um, so this takes stringable things and builds a structure. And here we've got an int structure, and here we've got a, a string structure. Now, if what we do is... Um, oh, and here we've got something else which I'll come to a bit later on. If we do the a binding analysis here. There's a two-string there that is bound, declared there. There's a two-string there that's declared there. And there's a two-string here that is declared there. So this is our static semantics. This takes a use of a name to its definition. We've got an entirely separate two-string here and here. And indeed, there. Um, so that's a declaration, that's a declaration, that's a declaration, all separate until we declare this module here. Because what I do here is I've applied this pair to two stringable things. For that to work, this, this string has to be of type stringable and int has to be a type stringable. So we link this two string to the two string up there. And we link the two string there to the two string there. And because we then build a pair from that int, and the result of that, the result of our pair now becomes a stringable thing as well. So we have to link that to the, um, to the two string up there. So what we've got here is a, an association of names which is not to do with static binding. Static, some, um, sorry to resolving a use to a declaration. It's a separate relationship that's established by this, the fact that we have effectively functions at the module level. And so what's been nice about this is that we've, um, in developing our tool, we've built a, a theory of this. So as Phil was saying, theory is, the th is your light in the darkness. And what we have here is a characterization that says, these purple arrows are the things that you need in order to build a valid refactoring, a valid renaming inside OCaml. So these things precisely characterize, together with the, the ordinary binding, what that, um, how renaming works. And we've got a paper at a conference in a couple of weeks' time to talk about that. So a nice thing about this is that building the tool made us rethink the theory. We developed some new theory coming out of that. Um, let's reflect on something else. So I said this was a bit of a tour. I'm going to, we've talked a bit about OCaml. Let's switch and talk about Erlang, and let's talk about what we did with clone detection, because there's another important lesson there. Um, one of the things that guided us to do clone detection here was people kept saying, oh, are you going to do clone detection? It was something that users wanted. And I'll come back to the, the user question a bit later on. Um, People talk about it's a bad smell. If you, do, if you have duplicated code, then you have the, the possibility if you bug fix in one place, you're not bug fixing the other, and so on. Um, bugs can be propagated more easily, potentially increases the size of the code. Um, so ha adding that facility made sense. Um, so what we did was we thought, well, what does it mean for code to be similar? Um, you know, these two things are both, at the top level, they're both additions. So we can see them 
as having an anti-unification. This is the dual of unification, if you're familiar with that. This is the least, the least general, common generalization of these two expressions. Um, and then we can see that we could, um, whoops, um, we can reflect the common part of the, the code as this, this um, function, and then these two things become applications of that function. So that's our process of clone detection, applied to sequences of expressions, not just to, to single expressions. So this gives us a handle over what similar code is. Um, but then you think, oh, well, what's a clone going to be? Well, it's not quite as simple as um, saying, well, this is a clone, this isn't, because there's going to be a threshold here. Um, for example, it would be possible to generalize any two things to a single variable. So we need to think about how big the, oh, I'm going to get this whole um, animation, sorry about that. We need to think how big the common generalization is compared to the things it's generalizing, for example. Um, so we call this a similarity. How big is the, the size of the, um, the generalization compared to the size of the, um, the constituent parts? But we might also think about how many new variables are introduced, how big it is, we might have a threshold for, you know, we don't want to look at things that are, are, have contained fewer than 10 tokens, for example. So we have to think about that, and in our, um, in our work, we came up with a, a set of defaults that we were a good starting point. Um, but of course, those are entirely open to, um, to you to choose for yourselves. So we're, we're beginning to see here that, that the idea of what a clone is, is is no longer cut and dried. It's something which has, um, which has gray boundaries. Um, but even so, we, we decide what a clone is. Um, so we set our parameters, and then we, we just eliminate clones. What could go wrong? We could build an automated tool to do that. We just press a button, and it will say, oh, it'll find clones, it'll like, pull them out, make them new functions, and continue. What could go wrong? Well, lots of things. Um, you can't name, you don't want your program to consist of names like clone one, clone two, clone three, clone four. You have to name the clones. You have to think about what they are. Um, you have to think about how you do it. You eliminate big clones first. They're going to be difficult to name. So perhaps what you need to do is eliminate the small clones first, give them sensible names, and then repeat. Um, but we're also going to get features like this. Um, where when we apply our clone detection, we get a situation like this. We'd like um, our, our clone detection says, oh, here's a clone. Um, but the first line of it, it looks a bit spurious. We're doing something sensible in the middle there. Um, and I've elided some other stuff. And then we do something a bit odd at the end. What we've got there is we've got those lines have been added kind of accidentally. They got stuck to the clone just because of our way of doing the detection. Whereas in fact, the clone that we'd like to, the clone that we can give a name to, is the thing with those two lines removed. So we call those things widows and orphans. They're things that shouldn't be attached to the, to the clone. So here, we, the thing that we, we would like to do is this, this function here, but the system because of the way the parameters worked, has given us that one. So, um, you know, as I say, we've got all that. So the only way that we were able to use this system in practice, and we did some work with some people at Ericsson using this, um, was to bring in the experts, because only they can say, oh, I can see what that function is doing. It's initializing that component, for example. Um, so they can choose how to eliminate the clones. They can choose how to name them, how to name their parameters. Um, and in fact, they learned from the process. We did this on test code that Ericsson had sitting in, in a cupboard, as it were. And they could see how that test code could be much better structured by using the, the clone elimination. Um, but it, it was clear to us that that says um, we are never going to get full automation for something like that. If we're building a tool. We have to build a tool that supports a user to do the things they want to do, Amy's automation was just a, 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 a complete red herring. So supporting user involvement rather than going for full automation. So those are two things in the, um, if you like, in the um, 
feasibility side, we showed we could do clone detection with user intervention. We showed we can do large-scale renaming inside OCaml. But let me move on now to desirability. Um, and I think I don't want to talk about one thing when it comes to desirability, because I think there are three things that we should talk about. One is about the obstacles, because there are some there are reasons people don't do things because there are obstacles in the way. There are reasons people don't do things because the good things aren't there. So there, there could be too many bad things. There could be not enough good things. But also, if we want to know what is desirable, what's usable, we need to do some observation. Um, so let me first of all talk about observation. You can gather data. Here are a couple of examples uh, of experiments we did. Looking at what we put into Wrangler in terms of functionality. What are the things that stick out? Renaming variables, renaming functions, moving functions between modules. People are using the tool for the simplest possible things. So aiming at those and to do those right is going to give us usability. One person folded against a macro one time. Um, three people inspected, they did a modularity inspection. Um, one person introduced a new macro. Well, that's good. It's nice to see that macros aren't being introduced. Um, but you know, not very much else. Folding, the, the next thing was function extraction. And that was the interesting with Lambda Stream, a company we did the experiment with. They used, that was the thing they used the tool for most. So giving tools to people, let them play with them, and then you can see what it is that you need to enhance was crucial there. So that, was, that, gave, us, that gave us raw data. Um, so keeping it simple seems to be the message from that. Doing the simple things well, that's why with OCaml, we concentrated on renaming. Getting really hammering away at renaming seems like the thing that will, will give Jane Street what they want, but also many other users. Um, but also, you can do other sorts of user observation. Um, you can do things yourself. You can work through pencil and paper. I did some work. Phil was talking about students earlier on. I did an interesting piece of comprehend trying to take student solutions to problems and turn them into improved solutions to problems. Let's put it that way. Um, so as an exercise in comprehension, seeing what refactorings you need to do that. Um, we did the exercise with Ericsson and Lambda Stream. We did some work with Qvic, who are the, the quick check people on developing a DSL. And we've done the work with, with um, the OCaml group. So finding out from users what it is they would like us to do and what, they, what feedback they can give us on what we've got is crucial. Um, so observing is really at the heart of this. Um, now, what about incentives? Why is it that people will use a tool? Um, well, there are a number of reasons why people will use a tool, and they'll tell us this. We can do things it would take too long to do without a tool. Fine. Um, we can be less risk averse, for example. We can try something. If something can be done very quickly, of course, you're working in a, a, a repository or whatever, you can undo it simply by reverting. Um, so you can try things. You can do some exploratory stuff. Um, but also, there's this, this point, which is perhaps a surprise, um, that there are situations where even if your tool doesn't behave completely correctly, even if it gets hits 90 or 95% of the cases and some have to be fixed by hand, People are happy with that. Um, and that's not our own uh, experience alone. Uh, the, the, people, the people who built the, the refactoring tool inside Apple's Xcode have got very similar um, responses. If you, can, if you can do most of the work, then people are happy to complete, or some people are happy to complete um, the last few cases for themselves. You might need, it's, it's counterintuitive. Um, and, it, and it potentially it's risky because there might be cases, there might be some difficult to detect things in that last 5%. But the argument is why not? You know, if, we, if we can try it, we can always revert um, at the end. You can always go and do the fix the last, instead of fixing 100% by hand, just fixing the last 5% might be okay. Um, and we can see two concrete incentives. I talked a bit about the Jane Street case earlier on. If you have a compliance overhead, then having a tool that gives you assurance that you're getting a correct refactoring means you can reduce the cost of code review. Um, the work we did with Qvic was they had a task, the way they built their, their model, their test models, um, they do testing for 
In this case, they were testing C code using Erlang models for C code. Um, they had a routine task of removing instrumentation before they shipped code. They didn't just want to switch it off with a macro. They wanted to remove it completely. And we worked with them on that using the, the little DSL we produced, and they reckoned that they were saving a person month of work per year because of that. And, you know, that's, that's, that turns into money. So there, are, there can be concrete incentives for using these things. Um, but there are, um, there are other things we have to worry about in that, in that case. Um, an incentive for using a tool can be, it's inside my favorite editor. A disincentive can be, it's not inside my favorite editor. Um, so we've done, both for Erlang and Haskell, we did surveys of what the most popular editors were, but of course that changes, and it's, it's, it's fragmented. So we're hoping that having LSP support um, will allow us to, to integrate with more editors. And we do have to worry about what's going on in um, build and test tools, and we have to worry about Windows. So we, making, it, making things acceptable to people is could be difficult. Um, but in the end, people would use a tool if the benefits outweigh the costs. Um, right, what about obstacles? Now, this is, the, this is the sort of embarrassing bit. Layout. You would not believe how wedded people are to their layout. Um, you know, in Erlang, you might write a list with commas after the elements, but you might write the commas before elements. There you are, you see? There are true believers on both sides. Of course there are, yeah, there are good reasons for doing it like this. But, ah, oh, golly. Of course this is not true. Do you put spaces between things in tuples? Oh, of course, in Haskell you can eliminate a token by, by using the infix application operator rather than parentheses. Um, and you've got similar things. Do you put your bar vertical bars before or after? That's a similar. And of course, if what you're doing is taking somebody's beloved code and um, transforming it and giving it back to them, and you've turned something like that into something like that, or you've synthesized a bit and you've produced it like that and they want it like that, they are really unhappy. So, you know, and you, th you think, of course, with Haskell, because it's layout sensitive, they'll just be, you know, there's just one way of laying things out. No way. Haskell is so... Um, there's so many different ways that you can lay stuff out. Um, so what can we do? Well, one problem with this, of course, is that most compilers, when you get far enough into them, have thrown away a lot of that information. They've thrown away comments. They've probably thrown away a lot of the, a lot of the concrete information about you know, things like parentheses and so on. You might, know where, you might know where identifiers live. They might have that information associated with them, but you're not sure where the parentheses are where the commas are. Um, so, ah, oh, this is a bit of a nightmare, but you've got to work with the existing infrastructure, so you finish up holding the token stream and the uh, AST, and then you're trying to build them together. It's, I mean, the fancy name for it is bi-directional programming. The real name for it is, is, is chaos. You know, it's, a, it's, not, it's not an easy situation to deal with. Um, because, because people do this. Um, an interesting quote from Jaron Minsky, who's an OCamela, um, just flipped a big code base over to doing automatic formatting. There's, uh, there's some regressions in readability, but there's something freeing about it. Nothing like not needing to make choices. So you know, one of the things that you, you come away from with this thinking, why, why do we still have to worry about text? You know, thinking about how much, you know, what people are doing in the 60s. People are talking in the 60s about moving away from programs as text. We're still worrying about positions of characters. We're still worrying about white space. Um, and this interesting quote from Don Stewart, um, again, a cost thing in terms of language design, it's cheaper to do code review if people aren't allowed to lay the code out as they wish. And Go, I think, has a, f has a standard formatter that you're required to use. So, um, but I, it's like, there's nothing like not needing to make choices. And it would be great for people who build tools that reconstruct source code to not to have to worry about your precious formatting, or our precious formatting, just to have it there. 
Um, <clears throat> so yeah, we, we lots of talk about moving away from from um, from text. It would be very nice to see that that happening. People say I've got types. I don't need a tool. Um, oh, sorry, I thought I removed that. No, this is. If you look on the web, I'm sorry, I perhaps I shouldn't look on the web for definitive answers, but it's good for, for inflammatory comments of various sorts. So you know, I wanted to make GHC is a big code base. It's a straightforward process to change a data type. So they were saying, it's great. Um, I'm, 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 less, I'm less convinced that this is a way of doing things at scale. Do you really want to fix a thousand type error messages? It just means that you become more risk averse. And I think then you can find arguments, you know, there's, Haskell is also very easy to and safe to refactor. Well, a very bad Haskell code could be worse than very bad Python code. I'm sure that's true. So you know, there's, the language doesn't necessarily um, come with, with a guarantee it's going to be easy to refactor. Um, and you can finish up doing quite complicated, quite complicated things by way of type changes. Sorry, this is just really putting those things in front of you. And there, is, there comes a point where sometimes the types of the language can get in your way rather than um, always assist with what you want. Five minutes, oh goodness, right, okay. Um, right, I'll flip over that then. Let's forget about that. So types can get in the way sometimes. Right, there is something that is both an obstacle and an incentive, and that is trust. Why should I trust your tool? Or why should you trust my tool? Um, well, there's a debate in the refactoring community. Some people say they're trustworthy enough. We can use them to get things done. It's, the, it's what Tony Hall said about the, American, uh, about the, the telecoms network. You know, saying it's, it's a pile of terrible code, but it works. Um, you know, it, it's good enough. It serves its purpose. Other people say, no, we must do things in a principled way and earn trust and give evidence of the way we build things or whatever so that we produce trustworthy stuff. Um, and this difficulty to review comes up. How can, we, um, how can we help people with review? We can do that by increasing trust in code. So what we want to do is preserve meaning. Now let me just take you a little jog around the park with this. Um, it's not quite clear what we mean when we say preserve meaning. Do we mean the main program does the same thing? Or do we mean all the bindings in the main module do the same thing? Or do we mean all modules do the same thing? Or all functions in all modules? It depends. We mean preserving a lot more than just the main program in general. Um, and you know, we need to think about what we preserve. What's the extent of the project? Do we preserve the make file? Do we preserve um, the the usage of conventions inside the test framework. Um, what do we do about particular libraries? So there are things we have to worry about. Now, just to make a very quick point, and then I think I will stop, we can think about meaning preservation in four different ways. Um, we can think about testing, perhaps automated testing, perhaps quick check. We can think about full-on machine verification. And we can think about it for two separate things. We can think about verifying a particular instance. So in this project, I've named, renamed this function foo to bar. Is that OK? Or my renaming operation for Haskell works in all projects. We can, do, we can think of doing both things. And we've done some work in each of those areas to try and increase this. So the first one, this is sort of state of the art for most refactoring tools. You do regression tests and hope things work. You can do this. You can take a code base and generate random refactorings on top of that code base and test for um, regression. You can also, if you have two refactoring tools for the same language, test them against each other. That's been done for Java, it's been done for Erlang. You can, you can synthesize random programs, random small pure programs, for example, in Erlang, and synthesize the programs, synthesize the, um, the refactorings, and test to see whether you have equal results. And those have been useful, and in that, in that case, we've used that to find errors in our own tool, in, other, in somebody else's tool. So testing can get you a long way. Testing helps us find errors. Um, but what if we want assurance that we have no errors? 
this gets more interesting here. I've, we're doing some work at the moment using a framework called CakeML, which is a verified compiler for ML. But prior to this, I had a, a Nick Sultana, a student, worked on verifying a renaming. And he did that in such a way to model what goes on when you do rename. That is, when you rename in a file, you potentially wreck the binding structure. So we had a lambda calculus which captured, um, which could potentially capture names. And we proved that with our precondition, no name capture took place. So it is possible to do that, but that's a, that's a proof of concept. What's the intriguing point in this space is this one, of trying automatically to verify instances of refactoring. So we've taken this, this code base, we've renamed foo to bar. Can we assure ourselves automatically that the two are the same? And again, we've done some proof of concept work there using SMT solving and building theories that reflect what's in those two programs and then um, ensuring, or building a theory that, sorry, that building a theory that, um, that reflects the proposition that these two programs have the same meaning. And that means that we can run the SMT solver and get one of two results. We, we get the result, yes, they are the same, or we get the result, no, they're not the same, and here's a counterexample. But of course, that isn't the case. What you can also get is the third answer, which is just the solver never stops. But it does give us a chance to get concrete evidence when, um, when things don't work. Now, I'm just going to, uh, I'm going to whiz through these and talk at the same time. So what I tried to do here is talk about the refactoring we, the work we've done in a bit of a context where we have um, we thought about the tools and we're trying to think about what the challenges were to build them, but also what were the, um, what were the challenges in, to being taken up. And the one I'd, I'd finish with is sustainability. And I think the short answer there is open source and get people to contribute. And that has been, we've had success in that. And I think that's a nice point to end. So building your tools to be open source so that you can get sustainability, people will help port them to other editors, people will port them to their own um, infrastructure and so on, is a way of ensuring that the tools you build will have a life after you stop working on them. And I'm going to stop now. Yeah. That's the open source. Thank you, Simon. Uh, we have time for some questions. Hi. Sorry, Hi. sorry for chewing into your time. Um, I was wondering if you had any thoughts on uh, libraries like Semantic from, from GitHub that help you translate or uh, attempt yeah, to translate. I think it's great that they're doing that, and it's in Haskell. It's interesting that I mean, Haskell is the right language for doing that sort of work. So, yeah, no, I think it's great. And I think it will, it will help people get out and start to do these things. And, you know, if, if people put effort into that, it means that there's a, there's a sustainable base on which other people can build build very good tools, hopefully. Because you don't want to be starting from scratch with each language. If you can rely on that, that would be very nice. Yeah, so I think it's great. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, hi, Simon. Hi. Hi. Uh, will, there be, uh, will there ever be a Wrangler for Elixir? And will the, the fact that Elixir has a default formatter help with those of us that put the commas first and whatnot? Well, it should, it, should, my, it should make everybody do that or nobody, I guess. If it's a good formatter, it wouldn't allow you to do the thing it didn't want you to do. The trouble is, I mean, but is it, I don't know enough about the formatter there. Is it configurable? Barely. And no, yeah. it doesn't allow us to put the commas first and do that kind of thing. Fantastic. <laughs> That's the best news I've heard all day. That's very... No, so I think Elixir is something it will be interesting to look at. I mean, we've not... I, did, I had a student who did some work using the macro system to try and do some, some refactorings, and that looked, in, in principle, it looked interesting, but I don't know whether in practice it would, it would give you exactly what you wanted. Um, because it was working effectively over the syntax. We weren't really doing much with, with any other analyses at that point. I think that would be the problem there. Yeah. So yeah, the things that I would remove if I were to, oh, sorry. Oh. There we are. So, no layout, no macros, no reflection, stable compiler, integration with a semantically aware change management tool. You know, something, this is kind of moving, I mean, this says, 
no text, right? And this sort of says semantics rather than, you know, it's not GitHub, it's something which thinks about, about the underlying structure. So I think, you know, that, that ha and then you can think about, if you do have semantically aware change management, you can think about commuting changes and so on. I mean, there's, there's lots of exciting stuff you can do there. But I think you, I, I guess what I would, my, my feeling there is you've got to start off saying we're going to design a language which a prime purpose is to make it amenable to refactoring and, and, and large scale refactoring um, and potentially verified refactoring. So we, if we can model the semantics in a, in a you know, we need a language which has a properly modeled semantics, right? Um, really. So there's a lot there. But, but moving away from text would be a great start. Macros cause a problem, reflection causes problems, all those things. I mean, you can, you can rule those out, but it's, um, and, then, you know, and then you can build a compiler that will, will export the right information. So you can imagine, there's a nice project there. There are a lot of nice projects there. Uh, so my question is, you uh, showed you had an um, API for defining new refactorings. Yeah. Is that kind of like JC's uh, rewrite rules? No, because those are, those are, in, those are lower level. Um, it, is, it works at the syntax level. That, I mean, what we try and do with that is, uh, and again, this was a, this is a sort of, um, so we have a template. So we, we're trying to use, just use fragments of concrete syntax to allow us to, to define rewrite rules. Um, and okay, this is, it, it looks horrible, but at least it's horrible Erlang. You know, if, you, if you read Erlang, then this probably is not too, it's not too, too difficult to read. And these are, um, you're allowed to have variable names that end with at. So that's, that's actual Erlang. Um, what we need to do, yeah, it was, to, and then you have, you need, to, there, are, there are bits of, of the meta language, so spawn, and you can apply things programmatically, so you need to think about abstracting away from function application. So it, it was a pragmatic set of decisions that we, we, we tried to build. Um, uh, I'm not sure it was, a, it, I'm not sure it was a rip-roaring success, but it, it allowed us to do some things more easily. Um, I think the DSL was more interesting. Putting, putting things together in a, tr in a way that you could control the transactionality of, the, of the, the composite refactoring was interesting, I think. So it's a place where you use a D, it's, it's more than a library because of the, you're, controlling <coughs> you're controlling the transactionality of assemblies of these, of these refactorings, and that was interesting. But 